exciting day of discussions and deliberations about the vitally important but often overlooked role of the maritime industry in shaping global economic prosperity and ensuring U.S. national security. Let's face it, prior to the great toilet paper shortage of 2020, the average American knew nothing about the maritime industry. And those that might have known about the maritime industry knew even less about the connection between the maritime industry and how their toilet paper is transported and the importance of that to our global and national security. I want to talk about a couple of key issues uh, today that I think are, are facing our industry uh, and there are many more than those that I'm going to talk about, but let's first just talk about the scale of what it is. It's no exaggeration to say that the maritime industry connects the world and is the lifeblood of the global economy which fuels our modern lives. Commercial ships crisscross the oceans carrying finished goods, commodities, raw materials, natural resources, and people from one corner of the world to another. Those maritime routes have shaped economies and civilizations around the globe. The maritime industry, depends on which statistic you read, but carries somewhere between 90 to 95% of the world's uh, traded goods. Here in the US, there are over 300 ports with over 3,500 facilities that meet, move people and goods across a dock. 25,000 navigable miles of waterways and 250 locks. Pre-pandemic, the maritime industry supported the employment of 31 million people in the United States, providing $1.4 trillion in personal income. That personal income that fuels consumption, which in turn increases the demand for even more maritime transportation. Plain and simple, seaports are vital to the economic engine. Cargo activity at U.S. seaports accounts for 26% of the U.S. economy. The importance of the maritime industry, however, goes far beyond economic prosperity. As you all know, it provides a pivotal role in our national security and national defense. In conjunction with the Department of Defense, the U.S. Maritime Administration, and we'll hear from Admiral Phillips uh, later, has identified 22 strategic uh, ports in the world, in the country rather. Those are both commercial ports and uh, naval ports. These strategic seaports are designated because of their ability to transport major force and equipment deployments in times of war and national emergency. Switching for a moment just to the vessel side, last January, there were just 178 flags of vessels in the U.S. flag fleet, and only 93 of those were Jones Act eligible. Our entire U.S. flag fleet of ocean-going commercial ships is fewer than 200, out of a global total of 44,000. That is just four thousandths of 1%. The greatest country in the world doesn't even have 1% of the global commercial vessel fleet. And despite trade flows to and from the United States exceeding trillions of dollars a year, most of it traveling by water, barely 1% of it is transported on a U.S. flag vessel. At key junctures in our national history, the United States was among the world's leaders in commercial shipboarding, shipbuilding capacity. Today, we build less than 10 ocean-going vessels a year. Meanwhile, our friends in China are building over 1,000 vessels a year. While there are over 200 businesses in the United States that are involved in shipbuilding and ship repair, just a child's handful, not even an adult's handful, 
of them are capable of building our warships. As the U.S. has languished in our shipbuilding capacity, China now has the largest fleet of world warships in the world, 50 more than we do. What's worse is that the average age of our ready reserve fleet is 50 years old, and it needs recapitalization. Let me switch to talk about the workforce. Whether it's ashore or afloat in the commercial maritime industry, or in the Navy, Marine Corps, or Coast Guard, workforce issues have the real potential to diminish our national security and economic prosperity, if not properly and promptly addressed. If young people today are even aware of the U.S. Merchant Marine, and I'm very happy to see uh, some with us today, they don't want to be on a ship or a tugboat for weeks or months at a time, away from their family and friends, working at all hours of day and night in all sorts of weather conditions and risks and threats, uh, often seven days a week, and God forbid, the potential of being without a cellular connection or a Wi-Fi for even a short period of time. The availability of merchant mariners, however, is critical to our national defense and national security. However, the U.S. Merchant Marine today is too small to support the military sea lift requirements in a time of war. A healthy commercial maritime industry, inclusive of larger U.S. flag fleet and a larger U.S. Merchant Marine, is critical to support DOD force mobilizations. This is not a new topic. Merchant mariners have delivered logistics and sustainment to war fighters for the past hundred years, suffering the greatest loss of life of any service in World War II. I'm thrilled uh, that today we'll be honoring uh, two gentlemen who served uh, in the Merchant Marine in, in World War II uh, with the Congressional uh, Gold Medal. Last summer, the Pentagon reported a troubling trend. Fewer and fewer young Americans want to serve in one of the armed forces. And of those that do, even fewer qualify. It's been said that the Department of Defense is in a fierce competition for skilled, relevant, and innovative talent. Recruiters face the challenge in pitching the benefits of enlisting young people when private companies are using impressive incentives to entice prospects. Let's face it, while the GI Bill was used to lure many recruits in the past, it is losing its gravitas when you can work for Amazon, still get a free education, and go home to your family and friends in the night. The entire maritime ecosystem, commercial and our sea services, needs the skilled workforce that can work with all of the advanced technologies, protect our ships, and protect our ports from cyber threats, track and analyze intelligence, construct, maintain, and operate the fleet and the terminals, all of which are becoming more sophisticated and even autonomous. Switching to supply chain resiliency uh, for a moment, we all saw what happened during the pandemic with uh, many ships, both on the West Coast, thankfully, much less so here in New York and New Jersey, uh, a little bit more as you went down into the South Atlantic, with ships that were uh, off, offshore waiting to get into the U.S. ports. We saw how fragile and delicate the maritime transportation system is and we saw how many products were delayed in getting to the medical industry, in getting to critical manufacturing, in getting to support, uh, even you know, manufacturing of defense systems. What, is, what was important during that time to understand is that by and large, the marine terminals, the ports, were not the point at which the supply chain had failed or was failing. It was everything downstream of the ports as you looked to warehouses and distribution centers and trucks and 
uh, truck drivers and the availability of chassis and, and whatnot, but it doesn't matter because the entire supply chain is inextricably linked and the entire supply chain needs to be working in precision in order for our ports to support both our global and national economy, our economic prosperity, our national defense and national security. Alfred Thayer Mahan, a naval officer and highly regarded historian, argued that control of the sea, both commercial use in peace and its control in war, and a strong navy are essential to a nation's economic prosperity. The correlation between maritime security and national prosperity that Mahan uh, talked about in the late 19th century and the dawn of the age of of globalization remains true today. Global trade creates national wealth, national wealth is required to build maritime power, and maritime power is essential to securing global trade. There is perhaps no greater modern day example of the link between global trade and maritime security than today, the Indo-Pacific region. Home to two thirds of the world's economy, and the United States' most substantial trading partners. The region is also home to both the most important and most vulnerable of the world's major shipping routes. 80% of the world's cargo shipments travel via the Indian Ocean, along with two-thirds of global oil shipments. It's no surprise, then, that that region also contains the greatest concentration of U.S. military resources than any other region outside of the United States, according to the Indo-Pacific strategy that the White House released uh, last year. The continued geopolitical importance of that region to the United States' economic and security interests is demonstrated in that strategy. Here at the Port of New York and New Jersey, we continue to monitor a shift of manufacturing from China to Southeast Asia and the Indian subcontinent. Countries like Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, India, Bangladesh are all on the rise for trade with the United States. While import cargo volumes at the Port of New York and New Jersey are up 5% compared to the pre-pandemic levels, our imports from China in New York, New Jersey, although still our largest trading partner, have dropped more than 4% compared to 2019. Of the top trend, 10 trading partners in Port of New York and New Jersey, India, Vietnam, and Thailand have seen substantial growths since the 2019 timeframe. This shift in manufacturing to west of the Straits of Malacca only further emphasizes the importance of the Indian Ocean to global trade as shippers choose westbound routes through the Suez Canal and, and into the Mediterranean and the east coast of the United States. This provides faster, cost-effective access to both European and North American markets, particularly the 134 million people in the United States that are dependent upon the Port of New York and New Jersey. Our national prosperity and security are entirely dependent upon the continued pursuit of a free and open Indo-Pacific policy for the region. Switching gears here for a minute to the environmental sustainability and climate change, the maritime ministry plays a crucial role in addressing global challenges. From combating privacy and illegal fishing to responding to environmental crises, the maritime community is on the front lines. It is essential to recognize the industry's dedication to sustainable practices, innovation, and technological advances, all of which are vital for tackling climate change and preserving our oceans for future generations. Trade and maritime security also share some of the same challenges. Among them, the vulnerabilities presented by sea level rise and other real realities of climate change. At this very minute, the Mississippi River is, is experiencing historically low water levels, placing U.S. grain exports at risk. Meanwhile, earlier this week, due to an intense drought, the Panama Canal further reduced the number of ships that can transit through the strategic waterway each day to just 30, 
down from a typical 36 to 38 a day. The administrator of the canal previously predicted that the canal's uh, income could fall by as much as $200 million next year alone because of the reduced traffic. But more importantly, he reported to a French news outlet this week that the El Nino climate pattern could worsen the situation further. He said, we have to find other solutions to remain relevant. If we don't adapt, we are going to die. We have to find other solutions. If we don't adapt, we are going to die. To die. Now, while that's a little dramatic, um, the dying part, uh, the, the frequency for ports like us of the inten and the intensity of climate-related natural disasters threaten critical port infrastructure and the surrounding communities that support port activity. The result is higher cost of port infrastructure projects that are resilient enough to withstand the adverse events along with the potential for more frequent supply chain disruptions. Likewise, the realities of climate change also increase the demand for maritime services to deliver humanitarian assistance and disaster relief both at home and throughout the world, straining existing capabilities and perhaps drawing resources away from more strategic missions. I'm particularly interested today in the discussion of the melting ice in the Arctic, the potential for an increased availability of a northern shipping route and opportunities for global trade alongside the potential realities of increased competition and conflict in those regions. At the Port of New York and New Jersey, we've committed to agency-wide sustainability goals that include a 35% reduction in Port Authority-produced greenhouse gas emissions by 2025, a 50% reduction by 2030, and to be net zero of all emissions from our operations by 2050. And we continue to consider the impacts of climate change, both locally and globally, as we plan for the future of the Port of New York and New Jersey. The maritime industry is not merely a driver of economic prosperity, but a guardian of national security. Our future is inextricably linked to the vast expanse of our oceans. Again, going back to what the Panama Canal administrator said, if we don't adapt, we're going to die. Again, not to be that dramatic, but the statement definitely makes the point that we cannot rest on our way with laurels. We need to adapt. So the challenge and the question for everyone today, as you proceed through the various sessions, is how do we chart the course to navigate through the turbulent waters that the U.S. maritime and U.S. maritime industry is heading into. In what ways does the maritime industry need to adapt? What do we need in order to preserve and strengthen the industry? How are we going to get there? Well, who do we need the support from to champion our efforts as we adapt? And what are our waypoints throughout the voyage? Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. I really look forward uh, to a very, what I know will be thoughtful uh, discussions and deliberations uh, throughout the day. And uh, I wish you all uh, a fantastic conference. very much for teeing up today in such a great way, defining the challenges that U.S. Flag Marine and U.S. Maritime Industry has going forward.